here. My name is Ann Wright. I'm a retired U.S. Army colonel, was 29 years in the military, and then I was 16 years in the U.S. Diplomatic Corps and ended up resigning in 2003 in opposition to the war in Iraq. And since then, I've been uh, working on various types of issues of concerning veterans. And this one that we'll talk about today, the issue of military sexual trauma, which is the Department of Defense's word for rape rape and sexual assault, but it's covered up by sexual trauma, a, a different phraseology that our military now uses. But in criminal terms, it's called rape and sexual assault. And that's really, I think, how we should be viewing this. Um, uh, the, the handout that's going around on this side, it is from the Department of Defense um, annual report on the issue of sexual assault. Uh, the, you can go online, you can download this thing. It's something like a hundred and some odd pages long. Uh, it is a congressionally mandated report now. And if, if women in the, in the U.S. knew about it, there wouldn't be any women joining the military. Because we do now know that over one third of the, the women, 30% of the women that are in the military are sexually assaulted. One in three women are sexually assaulted in the military in a short period of time, that time that they're enlisted in the, the military. In the year 2009, there were 2,670 cases of military sexual assaults. Uh, it is an 11% increase over the reports from the year 2008. The, the numbers in 2008 were a 10% increase over the numbers of 2007, which were a 10% increase over the numbers of 2006. There are two ways that women now are re uh, women and men are reporting because of that. 2,670, 87% of these uh, assaults were reported by women and 11% by men. So it's a real problem for women and men of just reporting it. And recognizing that, the Department of Defense now has two types of reporting. One is called restricted reporting, which means that you tell the command, something happened to me, I want medical and emotional treatment for it but I'm not going to pursue any legal aspects of it because essentially I know I'm gonna get screwed again. And I don't wanna go through this again. I don't wanna have anything to do with you, the chain of command on this, and I'm just going to, I want treatment and that's it. The other part of it is the unrestricted reporting that says I want emotional, physical treatment, and I wanna pursue this in a court of law. And I want you, the chain of command, to support me in moving this this forward and because there are rape rings that now we're hearing about in various bases there's one on bagram air base right now where women in the military are being told you had better go with your battle buddy everywhere you go uh, because there have been uh, so many rapes that have been happening on bagram air base something that has not been reported publicly yet so there are some of these cases that still the investigations have not been completed that, that, that go back several years. And if, unless they're on a base where the commander really is watching this and forcing the issues, then a lot of this stuff will, will the investigations will never even be completed. Um, in, well, in civilian courts, about 40% of the cases that are brought on rape and sexual assault end in conviction of, a, of the alleged perpetrator. Uh, in the, the the statistics in the military are that uh, less than 8%. That indeed, a civilian law firm has now created a class action lawsuit against the Department of Defense. They have interviewed over 100 women, taken legal depositions. Susan Burke, who is a, just a tremendous attorney who has taken on the Department of Defense on a lot of things to include uh, torture of Iraqi prisoners in by U.S. forces in Iraq. She's taken on the issue of contractor fraud and abuse. And in fact, right now she's in Dubai uh, deposing Eric Prince, the head of Blackwater, who's moving out. Susan Burke is a formidable opponent, and she, over the last year and a half, has been taking depositions from women and men who have been uh, raped in the military. Within their own military service? You know what? Yeah, what will what does this all mean? Well, right. it means that there that that uh, an institution called the Department of Defense, 
will now be on, on will have to defend itself in court uh, about what its policies and practices and programs are. It doesn't mean individual justice for individuals who have been raped at this point. Although the depositions, which will be a part of the public record of what's happened to these women, should give pause to a lot of, uh, a lot of people. It should help us get a lot of momentum behind this to really put pressure on the military to say, you know, there are ways you can get this stuff to stop, that you can, you can uh, demand an environment in the military units that says this is unacceptable behavior, and if it happens, if I'm a commander in a unit and one of you guys do this, your career is over. Let me, for example, in the case of Suzanne Swift, yeah. which three yeah. years ago, repeatedly raped by a, a, the platoon sergeant who's in Iraq, who said, if you don't do what I tell you to do, let me do to you what I want to, you know, this is a combat zone, you'd be dead tomorrow. And in fact, we know of young women who have been raped and then found dead. We know Tina Priest was killed 10 days after she was raped. We know that Lavina Johnson was found murdered six days after she got to Iraq. Um, fluids found in her genital areas. Um, we know that this stuff happens, that women are murdered in the, in the combat zone. And the ability of a senior NCO or officer to uh, coerce people saying, if you don't do this, nobody's gonna question your death. And in fact, they don't question it. The military doesn't question the deaths of these people. We've got three more women, young women, that have been killed in the last four months. Been killed. It's called non-combat related incidents. It's the way it's reported in the uh, in the newspaper. And you think, oh well, maybe their truck turned over or you know something happened. But they were wounded. They died of gunshot wounds. Well, how did this happen? Uh, they were murdered by our own people. That uh, Jeff. It is. It, uh, we don't know the full story of all of this. We don't. We know in this DOD report that you can look up online, it actually does give uh, the rank structure of who was committing rape on whom, uh, what ranks it was. So that's interesting too, because there's a lot of senior NCOs that are part of this stuff. There are commissioned officers that are part of it. It's not necessarily the junior troops that are doing all of it, although some of it happens. Uh, but it, it seems to me as the more that I hear of the, the stories, it's more of a, it's, it's an atmosphere within the unit that comes from the leadership of the unit. And it also goes back much longer than we think. Uh, because of the code of silence that you were talking about, there are a lot of women that were in the military when we were in during the Vietnam War that have never talked about this stuff, never talked about it. But now they are. This is They're that you know. It's just not women in the military in a combat zone that are, that are being raped. The issue of women contractors in the combat zone. Uh, the young woman Jamie Lee Jones that was raped uh, three years ago, uh, raped, gang raped, and put into a uh, container and kept in the Did container you? for 48 hours. And finally, she got a cell phone and called her mom and called a U.S. congressman who came over and got her out of there. And there are more and more women. There are now there are three or three or four lawsuits underway right now against KBR uh, for women that have been raped in the last year. There's a website that's always very interesting to keep track of of events going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's called Miss Sparky M S S P A R K Y. Kind of a strange thing. This is a woman who was a contractor in Iraq. She was she did her year or two years, made her money, got the hell out of there. And she now exposes the fraud, waste, and abuse that goes on, and she keeps track nationwide of articles that come out wherever she can hear of things that are happening uh, on the issue of sexual assault, rape, contractor abuse, everything. It's one of the best websites I've ever seen. Um, when you finally, when you know somebody has committed rape and murder, uh, what happens? We remember the case of Marie Lauterbach, the young Mar woman Marine two and a half years ago that was uh, found burned and buried. She and her the, the fetus burned and buried in the backyard of her the guy that raped her, her former boyfriend, and then he fled to Mexico. Well, finally it took a year to get him extradited out of Mexico, and the court-martial was just this last <coughs> week at Camp Lejeune, uh, 
and he was uh, found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, but in one level, I mean, that takes three years for a very high profile case. And can you imagine for all of these other cases that are not high profile at all? And we did have a, um, a, a remarkable, um, a remarkable event in Times Square last October where Eve Ensler, who's done so much work on sexual assault all over the world, and women all over the world, she met with us, a young woman, uh, uh, Sandra Lee, a woman, uh, Air Force, no, an Army woman, who had been raped in the military and never spoken publicly about it. And she came forward in, it, in a press conference we had on Times <coughs> Square uh, talking about being raped in the military. And that video is online, so you can you can download it. You can show it at any sort of meetings that you want to. They do. So I would please, I would beg of you, buy five or ten of them, take them home with you, uh, put them on the recruiting doors, take them to the high schools when you have events that are going on there. Because as, as Jim mentioned, I mean, it is women don't know this. They don't know the statistic. But one, when you bring up uh, other parts to this that. While there, there's rape uh, against other members of the military, but when you look at the issue of domestic violence of within the family structure itself and the high, extraordinary high levels of domestic violence in military families. Uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina has the highest incidence of domestic violence in the country. It has uh, two military bases there, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, one of the largest in the country, and Pope Air Force Base. Uh, but you within the family structure of the military, there's a heck of a lot of family violence. And because when these guys and gals come back, they're trying to reintegrate into their family. It's just so difficult for them. In Hawaii last week, we had a, a horrific situation where a um, fellow who had been in the uh, Hawaii National Guard, deployed to Iraq twice, had severe PTSD. Uh, he, na he murdered his partner and daughter and then committed suicide. Uh, so it's, you know, the, the whole issue of within the family structure is something very, very important we should keep in mind. Uh, and for, for example, this Maria Lauterbach that was murdered, she had attempted to get out of the same unit. She'd even gotten a temporary restraining order, a civilian TRO against this guy that eventually murdered her, and the military would not separate them. They kept them in the same unit.